Hello, I'm Avon Brownlee. I am in the biology department at Houston Baptist University. I came here in the fall of 1973, which means I'm about to finish up my 49th year here at HBU. The first 17 years I was a, you know, just a classroom faculty member. And then the next 17 years I was actually department chair. And I got kind of tired of that, so I gave that up. In the last 15 years I've been back in the classroom. Uh, I came here mainly because I was just looking for a job. I didn't realize until years later the way all the circumstances came together that it was really God's will for me to be here at HBU. I don't know if they want to know that story or not. If they do, they can ask me a little bit later. But anyway, uh, I'm married to Nancy Brownlee. She just recently joined the faculty here at HBU in the uh, School of Nursing. I have two children. My youngest son graduated from here in 2007. And uh, I think I've run out of gas. You know what? I'll tell you what. I'm just sitting here thinking, you started here in 1973. Probably before you were born. Well, I will tell you, it was, <laughs> no, I'd been born by then, but I, I got born again right around that time. Oh, period. really? Yeah. So that year is very special to me. Um, but 49 years? Yes, sir. 49 years teaching. Well, I've taught longer than that. I taught at Stephen F. Austin one year, and then I was a high school teacher for four years. So I've actually had like 55 years of uh, classroom experience. That, and your mother is 102. My mother's 102. And your dad lived? To 100. To 100, so you? So I've still got uh, 25 years to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man. What's it like being in the classroom for 50 years? Well, for me, it's very enjoyable. Obviously, I couldn't have done it for that long if I didn't enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy what I call the aha moments when you've got a class in front of you and you see somebody or maybe two or three people in the class suddenly sort of get it, you know. Another very, very rewarding part of this job is having students come back to you and tell you what they remember, how much they learn from you, how much they appreciate you. And that's happened just at HBU ever since I started here. One of the, a very prominent physician here in Houston right now was in the very first class I taught at HBU. And uh, he's still a practicing physician and uh, we see him four or five times a year, you know. And he never fails to tell me how much he appreciates, you know, what I helped him do. And that happens all the time, you know, so it's very rewarding. Now, you mentioned in your introduction about the will of God bringing you here. And I want to ask you about that story. Okay, uh, it's a long story. That's okay. Okay. Um, when, uh, when I was still in grade school, for some reason or another, I had already made my mind up to be a college professor. I don't exactly know where the idea came from, but when we had our eighth grade graduation, the class prophecy had me as being a college professor. I might have gotten the idea from my uncle. I had an uncle, Leon, who was a professor at Memphis State. And I remember asking him one time how much he taught. And you know, my dad worked in the natural gas field and he worked 40 hours every week. I asked Uncle Leon, uh, how much do you teach? And he said, 12 hours a week. I had no idea what a semester hour was, and so I thought he actually worked for 12 hours a week and the rest of the time <laughs> he was off, so I thought that might not be a bad idea. So anyway, I went off to college, undergraduate school. Uh, had no idea what it takes to be a college professor. I thought you just kind of started at the bottom and worked your way up. So I took a job teaching in high school and my second year on campus, I got a, uh, a brochure from the National Science Foundation advertising uh, a program for science teachers who had to teach more than one discipline to, you know, to go to graduate school and get your master's degree. So you had to have had three years experience to get in that program. I only had one year, but something just told me to go ahead and try it anyway. So 
I did, and I got accepted to a few places. So I chose the University of Mississippi because their program was three summers instead of four. So that seemed like a good thing to me. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, I need to back up a minute. When I was in college, I had some uh, health problems and actually spent uh, a month at MD Anderson in 1963. And one of the things that happened during that time is that I uh, had some serious complications and the, well, the, what I had had to begin with was a malignant tumor that was extremely uh, harmful and I was expected to live maybe six months to a year. So I had surgery on that, came to Houston. The procedure they did here was sort of experimental and it really, I found out years later, didn't work. But so my, I really, I think my life was saved by the surgeon who went in and did the uh, second surgery on me. But anyway, while I was here, I was in Houston over a month because of the complications I had. And they let me leave the hospital one time. My mom and dad were here and we drove down Highway 59 and we drove right by where HBU is now. Although I don't remember actually seeing HBU, but I was on Highway 59 right next to HBU's campus because we drove all the way out to Richmond. Anyway, fast forward back to graduate school. I uh, got my master's degree at Ole Miss and then decided to uh, try to stay and get my PhD. So I finished all the work on my PhD except for writing my dissertation. I had run out of financial support so I had to start looking for a job. This was in 1972. At that time, there were apparently many, many more PhDs than there were jobs. So I wrote, to, literally wrote to every school in Texas, most of them in Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and the eastern half of New Mexico looking for a job in a college. And everybody said, no, we don't have anything, or I didn't hear from them. So I had actually started looking for another high school job and had was like just two or three days from having to sign a contract to go back and teach high school. And then I got a phone call from the department chairman at Stephen F. Austin telling me they had this one day, I'm sorry, not one day, one year, but temporary, it was full time, but temporary one year appointment. Would I be interested in it? I said, well, yes, sir. You know. So they hired me right then. I didn't fill out an application. I didn't f send a transcript, no letters or recommendation, anything. They just gave me the job. I guess they figured I couldn't mess too much up in one year, you know. So anyway, I come to Stephen F. Austin. I'm in the same predicament I was the year before. I've got to find another job. So I wrote all these schools again, and I got a letter from... Um, the Vice President of Academic Affairs here, his name was H.B. Smith, said, no, we don't have anything, but if you're ever in Houston, drop by for a visit. So I had Friday afternoons off, so I called him up and said, I'm coming down next Friday, can I see you? And so I came down, we visited a little bit, and uh, he said, we don't have anything, but uh, maybe try Houston Community College, they're starting. So I thought, well, I'll never be here again, you know. The next Friday he calls me back, says, well, it turns out we do have a job here. Can you come back for another interview? So I came back down, met the department chairman for biology for about five minutes. He asked me one question and one question only. Then they took me to the dean of the college, and the dean was not very friendly. He was kind of... Uh, cold and harsh, just not too, well, just not very friendly. Then they took me to the president. The president visited with me a few minutes, showed me the HBU uh, catalog with the mission statement on the inside, asked me to read that and see if I can agree with that, and I said, of course. So he said, well, you go home and think it over this weekend, and Dr. Smith will call you Monday and make you a definite offer. So Monday they called me up, gave me the job. Now this, they did not have an application. They did not have a letter of reference. They did not have a transcript, none of that stuff. But they gave me the job. 
When I was in the hospital at MD Anderson, they had to do emergency surgery on me a second time, and I knew I was in really, really bad shape, you know. So I remember praying. I didn't pray for God to save my life, or if you do this, I'll do that, you know. I just remember saying or thinking or whatever you do, you know, that it seems like there's a lot of potential here, you know. And it, so I was hoping it wasn't going to go to waste, you know. <laughs> so anyway, after that, I recovered from it, obviously. Uh, I just kind of let my life happen. I just kind of didn't make serious long-term plans. And so anyway, God sent me to Houston Baptist University, and that was almost 50 years ago. I'm probably the only professor anywhere in this country who's gotten two full-time jobs on a college without having a letter of reference, a transcript, or an application filled out. <laughs> About eight years later, when we were getting ready for our visit with the SACS accreditation people, you know, they have to prove everybody's credentials. There wasn't anything, anything in my folder except my W-4 forms. So I had to get a transcript sent, you know, seven years after I'd been hired. So, you know, those are just some kind of weird circumstances that I think in the long run were God's way of leading me here. And he hadn't led me away yet, so I think, I think that's why I'm here. That's an amazing story. I mean, when you think it'll be 50 years next year. Now, your wife recently has joined the faculty? Yeah, she joined just this year. Just this year. She, was, uh, she graduated from our nursing program in 1980. Okay. And then uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago, she changed professions. She, she changes professions about every seven years. <laughs> Uh, I'm the only thing she's kept longer than seven years. <laughs> We've been married 38 years. Yeah. But anyway, so she was uh, going from her previous profession in the financial in industry back into nursing, so she was getting her nurse practitioner degree, and she taught here as an adjunct faculty for two or three years, you know, just part-time. And then uh, she decided to, she quit her other job and was just going to, thinking she would come here part-time again for a while. And uh, next thing we know, she's full-time here. How she's big, very excited. That's, that's really, really fantastic. Um, how big was the school in 73? Well, I'm not sure. I thought we had around 1,000 or 1,100 students. When, and I've had other people that tell me, no, we didn't have but like five or 600. So mm -hmm. I actually tried to find out. And uh, I called the registrar's office, I called the provost's office, and apparently they don't have <laughs> records that go back that far. Tell us about the changes you've seen from 73 to now. Well, uh, in the student body, there's been a tremendous amount of increase in the diversity of our student body. Yes. In 73, uh, I say 75 or 80 or maybe even more percent of our students were uh, you know, uh, just white, white students, you know, local students, most of them Christian. Now, at least in the sciences, we have lots and lots of uh, people from East Asia, Middle East, uh, uh, you know, South America, India, and we didn't have any of that when I first came. I can remember the first Indian student I ever saw. I can remember the first student from Vietnam, the first student from you know, the Middle East. So there's been a huge increase in diversity. That's mostly because I think the way the school has, as it's grown, has reached further out. You know, uh, probably 90% of our students in 1973 lived within five or six miles of the campus. There's been a big diversity. I mean, there's been a big increase in our diversity. And of course, uh, at the time I came, I think we had three academic buildings. We had this quadrangle here that we're in. We had the library, and we had Atwood One. That was it. There were a couple of little dorms, and there was a gymnasium and a president's house, and nothing else. <laughs> And now, you know, it's just 
buildings everywhere. I, I, if I count it up, I'd probably count 12 or 15 buildings that have been built since I've been here. And the student enrollment, you know, has increased probably anywhere between five and 10 times what it was. That's an amazing, uh, <laughs> what, what's the secret to your staying power? What do you do, eat Wheaties or what is it? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I have a secret. Uh, I just, you know, get up and face each day. Kind of like, I wake up kind of like a goose. I don't remember what happened the day before. And so maybe that's been uh, part of the secret. I don't remember any, any of the bad stuff. But you said a moment ago, you do enjoy what you're doing. Oh yes, very much. And I mean, isn't it true that one of the secrets to longevity and obviously all the things that happiness in life is doing something you like? Well, I think so. And also doing a job like what I do where I am spending most of my time with younger people. Mm -hmm. And so I think their youth and enthusiasm rubs off a little bit. You know. Now, with that uh, ethnic diversity transition that's, that is here at HBU, do you encounter more students now who, I know we, we, we don't have a policy, you have to be a Christian to go to HBU. And I'm really glad we don't because I feel like, first off, I think only God really knows who's a Christian and who isn't. It's easy to say you're one. God really knows who is and isn't and isn't. Although we're a distinctly Christian university, we leave the door open to whosoever will may come. Are there more non-Christian students in the sciences than there were when you began? Yes, definitely. And so what is it like for those students when they come from your perspective as a, as a professor, being learning the sciences, but learning also that these are Christian professors who love Christ and share their faith. How is that received by those students? Uh, I think it's received very well by most of them. Uh, I've had fundamental Muslim students who, uh, you know, have no problem with us praying in the class, no problem with anything that we do, you know. They, uh, they're here, I think, first of all, to get an education. And I think also a lot of our students uh, like the, uh, I don't know what the best word is, security of having uh, an environment like this, you know. Mm -hmm. So. I haven't had any student of any uh, religious or ethnic background ever try to, uh, you know, make me do anything different than what I do all the time. You know, you, and the, the Judeo-Christian values that we teach bring a whole set of character lessons, morality, uh, things that, in my opinion, are just absolutely essential for a successful life. Um, you can't stay married if you're a liar, right. generally. You can't maintain a job if you're a thief. I mean, there, there's many values to a strong, committed Christian lifestyle. Uh, I have to believe that some of these men and women families who come from what we would call non-Christian backgrounds or other religions, they too see the value of the values we teach here at HBU. Would you agree? Yes, in fact, I can give you an example of students who, you know, like first generation students who came from India, where they were surprised to find out that they weren't supposed to cheat. They thought that this, the more successful you were, the better you could cheat. Mm -hmm. And when they got caught and called on it, you know, it was, what? You know, we mean we can't do this? We're not supposed to do this, you know? So they were learning values from us, you know? And, you know, we take this kind of for granted as an American, but having traveled globally like I have, there are certain nations and cultures where dishonesty, bribery, I mean, it's how you climb the corporate ladder. Right, yeah. That's what I was just talking Asia, about. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, now, Dr. Brownlee, as, as you think about, uh, and I, I do want to just comment, you received the Opal Goolsby Outstanding Teacher Award in 1978, 1982, 1988, 1998. In 2009, Dr. Brownlee was the Piper Professor nominee for the College of Science and Math. I mean, you've had a lot of recognition here. 
And you're, and, and you know, I, I've got a lady here that I really love a lot, Rita Tower, and she just can't talk enough about how great you are. And we knew we had to have you write in the issue of the Pillars Magazine, HB's publication, highlighting academic excellence. Because we felt like if anybody could write on that and have a perspective, it would be Dr. Avon Brownlee, who's been here for nearly 50 years. <laughs> so what did you write? Well, actually, I didn't write on that. Okay, tell me what you wrote. I wrote more about how I've seen the, uh, the Christian commitment of this university not only persist, but to kind of grow and to increase. And so uh, that's what I wrote about. And to me, that is academic excellence, to be honest with you, because I, I was saying in a previous broad podcast, I, I sat last week with a, a representative of a, a, a pretty renowned American family who um, they had funded a great deal to a university, you know, many millions of dollars. And that university, unfortunately, lost their spiritual footing. And they've begun to vacillate on all the social issues and kind of a, a, a president that doesn't know how to lead. And so he lets, you know, kind of the, the inmates run the asylum, so to speak. And, and it is turning into an asylum. And this family that did so much, unfortunately, left. And it was really a joy to me to pull out the Pillars magazine of fall 2021 and and let them see that not only have we embraced what we call core convictions for 2030, but that our president shared that with the entire faculty and asked all the faculty to embrace it. And if they couldn't, that's fine. They can teach somewhere else. But this is what HBU is all about. It was one of the proudest moments of my life here because I think if you don't know who you are, you'll become anything. Right. And uh, what, what did that mean to you? I mean, no, I mean, that's a profound statement you made a minute ago that the Christian convictions of, and moorings of HBU have gotten stronger. That's very antithetical to a lot of the Ivy League schools and right. all the stories we know. What does that mean to you? Well, one of the things that means, and it means this, I think, to our entire school is as that message is spread into the community, like Dr. Uh, Sloan has done and like our new provost has done, it actually helps the university a lot more. I think we get, you know, just thinking of uh, monetary things, we're getting a lot more interest in buildings and stuff like that on this campus since that message has been more prevalent and more widespread. And uh, I think the more we do it, the, the more it will help the university. There are people out there who want something like this. And uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we were like that, but not very many people knew it, you know. And so I think more than anything else, uh, shining our light to the world has really helped the school. I couldn't agree more. And I think there are many non-Christians who realize that raising children and sending them to be educated in a in a university that has no absolutes, that just redefines everything, is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, it, it would be it would be almost like having Interstate 10 in Houston with no with no traffic signals and no speed limit, and it would be a sheer disaster. Um, thank God for Dr. Sloan. Thank God for his convictions and leadership. And, and I appreciate you recognizing that trade, and I'm glad you wrote on that very candidly. Um, I want to just ask you in closing, I mean, we need some tips to endure, okay? For all these people that haven't had a 49-year career in one place and four or five years before, I mean, you need to write a book on this, how to hang in there or how to keep on swinging or whatever you want to call it. Go ahead. Um, I don't know that I have any tips. Uh, you caught me off guard on that. I mean, you look really healthy 
Thank for you. showing up at work nearly on your 50th year. Well, see, I'm, it's kind of a, I'm kind of a weird person. I'm only 62 years old. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I guess maybe I'm very healthy because I have very healthy parents, you know, and I think uh, probably the most important thing about longevity is picking the right parents, you know. <laughs> and so I did that. Uh, if you need to like what you're doing, love your job, the people I work with are very, very congenial. And, you know, if I had cranky bosses or cranky people I was working with or when I was department chair, if I had cranky people I had to discipline, it would have been very hard. But HBU, is, to me, has been an ideal place to work. I feel very fortunate all my life. I had an ideal childhood. I grew up in a little community that only had about 100 people in it, you know and kids could just do anything we wanted to as long as we didn't get in trouble. But I mean, we could run and play all the time, you know, and then uh, came here, where it, which, you know, it's just, I think, a wonderful place. So find your little happy spot and uh, stick with it if that's what makes you happy, I guess. Well, and you know, that resounds with gratitude. And I can tell you have a lot of gratitude in your life. And there's been studies done on people who live in an attitude of gratitude, the difference it makes. And it reminds me of what Paul said, give thanks always for all things. It's easy to say thank you, God, when it's good. But the fact is, a lot of tough days, and we've got to thank God because we know, just like in your story, I mean, it's remarkable. <clears throat> no, no application, nothing, and you were serving for nearly eight years. Um, well, you've stood the test of time. We congratulate you, Dr. Brownlee. Thank you. I wish I would have known who you were when we sat at the gala, and I would have teased you a whole yeah, bunch probably, more that night. probably moved to a different table. <laughs> <laughs> there is a place for you at HBU. Undergraduate, graduate, online. The university reaches out today and says, check us out, hbu.edu slash admissions, 281-649-3211. Our graduate school, hbu.edu grad, G-R-A-D, 281-649-3269. And HBU here in Houston has students in 42 states all over America. And you may be like an, another person who said, you know, I started my degree and I, I didn't finish it. I'm tired of the job I have, but I got to keep on working. How do I finish my degree and motor on? Come to HBU Online. It doesn't matter where you live or what state you're in. HBUOnline.com. Counselors will help you figure out how to do that at 855-428-1960. And as Dr. Brownlee has pointed out, in 1960, there were people who gave to make this vision happen, and they've been followed by many others. And we invite you, as you think about giving, to remember you're giving to HBU will make the vision of this university happen as we teach constitutional law and freedom, free enterprise, teach Christian ethics with a beautiful academic <coughs> courses that challenge students. How do I give online? A secure portal, hbu.edu giving, 281-649-3222. Dr. Brownlee, I'm so grateful for you. It's a real honor to sit here. I'll tell you what, I like that sweater you got on. You saw this sweater that night we were sharing that table. You remember that? Yeah, I thought I did. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> I was thinking, I was trying to think how to get it off you and take it home without you knowing it, but I, I finally realized that wasn't going to happen today. You know, I had a student who <clears throat> asked where I got it, and I told him the bookstore, and I saw him later today, and he said they don't have any of those in the bookstore, but they told me they were getting some, so maybe if you'll just wait a couple of weeks, you can go get one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing what you're doing. We're proud of you. Thank you.